Well, good morning, everybody. It is a good day to be in church. I asked God for a little rain this morning, kind of washed everything out. So I'd like to invite you to stand. You may be seated this morning. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that with the price that you paid with your death, Lord God, the fact that you have offered to forgive and take away our sins, that is available to any single one of us. Your life in replacement, in exchange for the death that we deserve. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. Thank you that you have not excluded anybody, that you are there for the asking. We approach you, we repent, and according to your righteousness, we are healed. We bless your name this morning, Jesus. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I'll raise a hallelujah.
Every time we sing that song, I always think of the story in Acts 16 where Paul and Silas, preaching the gospel, they get arrested, they get beaten, they get stripped, they get thrown into prison, and they get put in stocks. And the scripture says that around midnight, and that always speaks of darkness to me, around midnight, they raised their hands and began to sing. And they sang songs of worship and hymns to, to praise God. And there they were, stripped, beaten, in prison, in stocks. And what did they choose to do? They raised their hands and they worshiped God. And the story goes on to say that God sent an earthquake and shattered their, their chains and let them loose and the jailer got saved. So when we face horrible things, if we would choose to worship, because He is the way maker, our next song is the way, but he, he can do the impossible. But when we praise Him, that opens the doors for Him to do it. So worship with us this morning and whatever impossibility you're facing, worship God and let Him take care of it. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship You, I worship You. You are here, working in this place. Oh, I worship you, I worship you. Sing that again, you are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you.
silver light in the darkness my god that is who you are so much for your spirit in this place today. We thank you for your power and your strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and greet somebody next to you from New York. Glad to see them, children and youth. You are dismissed to the back. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Hey, everybody. And once again, thank you for joining us as we um, spend some time together online. We hope that you're doing well. And you know what? I ran into somebody this week who let us know that they've been watching online and it was so encouraging to know that they were out there. And so, um, so hi, Tiffany. Um, and so I would just really ask that those of you who are out there and you watch consistently, you know what? drop a line, text the church, what, however, let us know that you're out there because we wanna pray for you and we just are excited that you're there. As always, I wanna thank you for your continued support. I know God blesses you as you sow into his kingdom. Hi church, this is me in my trunk. I definitely don't belong here, but you know what does? You. Well, not you, that came out totally wrong. What belongs in the trunk is candy and decorations for a trunk or treat. So we need you to sign up to host a trunk today.
Bye. and their friend and their cousin all to our amazing ladies event. It's coming up, it's only three weeks away. That means we need you to register online or scan our QR code as you leave today. The event starts at 5.30 p.m. on Friday, October 14th. It's going to be so much fun. And I'm excited because the first hour is just gonna be all of us playing games and having snacks. It's my favorite part. Pastor David is bringing worship with the team, and Pastor Joni is bringing the word. And it's only $30, so sign up today. You need to be there. We can't wait to see you. Hey, are you a part of the trades? Maybe you're a painter. Maybe you're a concrete, drywall, electrician, garage door opening. Whatever it is, plumbing, whatever your trade is, on October the 6th, which is a Thursday night at 6.30, we're going to have a taco truck outside. And what we're going to have is just a meeting of guys that are and gals that are in the trades. So if you're in the trades, we want to encourage you. We want to help you. We want to link arms together. We want to pray with one another. And we want to help each other in our businesses and our trades. And so join me for the trades, a new group, on Thursday, October 6th. At 6.30, tacos are free. Hey church, the month of October is almost here and we wanna make it extra special and extra fun just for you. So we wanna encourage you guys to bring a friend, a family member, someone to church. We're calling it Buddy Month. And I want to see you here. Meet me outside at service. All they have to do is fill out a little, little bit of information about themselves. They'll get a prize, you'll get a prize, we'll get to know each other. And we just pray that, that this would be a great opportunity for you to invite somebody to church. And here's Pastor Mark as he continues on in his series, I Can Because God Won't. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the Foothills Church. We've got a great message today on on what God won't do, another thing that God won't do. You know, God won't lie to us. God won't ever leave us or forsake us. And there's another thing we're going to talk about today that God won't do. And because of it, then yes, I can. And uh, so before we get into this message, uh, can we bow our heads and have a word of prayer? Uh, Father, I want to thank you for today. And Lord, you know, it's, uh, it's September now and fall has officially begun. And Lord, usually with, with fall and winter is when our world is starting to go dormant, leaves are falling, uh, the ground is, uh, is not as fertile, plants aren't growing as much, and, and you know, just things go into a season of dormancy or death. But not our church, Lord, not our church at all. Um, you're bringing life and, and, and strength and vigor to our church. And Father, we, we thank you for the renewal that's happening at the foothills. And so we're excited about this new season. And I want to thank you for today's message. And I pray, God, that you would uh, anoint me and anoint our ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most powerful things that God won't do is hold grudges. Let's talk about grudges for a minute, holding grudges. Um, the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 15 says this, see to it. So this is your choice. See, you can do this. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Oh, that's heavy. I don't want to miss the grace of God. How do you miss the grace of God? Having a bitter root grow up among you and cause trouble and defile people. You know what the bitter root is that, that, that grows up to cause trouble and defile many? Holding grudges. Resentment. If you hold a grudge, if you bear a grudge against somebody that's hurt you or offended you, then a bitter root is going to take place in your life, and it's going to grow up, and it's going to cause trouble and defile many. But what it really does is it causes you to miss the grace of God. Holding grudges is a lousy, lousy, lousy way to live. It's not good. I used to hold grudges, but I've learned over the years I've got to forgive. So I have become a forgiving person because that's the best way to live. And because 
It's commanded by God. We've talked about forgiveness many times in our church. Forgiveness is so important. Yes, I can forgive is one of the things that we talked about back in August, a few weeks ago. Yes, I can forgive because God's forgiven me. That's the grace of God you don't want to miss out on. And so holding a grudge is a lousy way to live. Okay, so you're hurt or offended. Who hasn't been? Who hasn't been? And our society today has become very offended um, about every little thing. I mean, people are just up in arms about things that you're like, why can't you just get over that? That's not, that's not cause uh, for, you know, for freaking out or getting so angry or hurt or upset. It's almost like we're manufacturing hurts. We're manufacturing offenses so we can feel important. It doesn't make you important. So you're hurt or offended, like everyone. And then, and this is the way a lot of people in our world are, but it should not be the way we are. Out of anger or the need to get even, refuse to let it go. Refuse. See, what that is, is a lack of forgiveness. A lack of forgiveness causes a bitter root to grow up within you. And our, our world, our society, our culture has become bitter and it's causing trouble, and it's defiling many. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. Who does it hurt? When you're hurt and you refuse to get over it, who does it really hurt? The person that you're offended at or you? Who becomes the lesser person? The person who hurt somebody, maybe unintentionally, or the one who then can't get over it? Who becomes the lesser person? Who, due to their anger and hatred, become difficult to live with? Uh, sadly, many of the people that you're holding a grudge against, they're past it. And you're not. They're over it. And you're not. They've moved on. And you haven't. They're living free of it. They sought the Lord and asked him for forgiveness. Or they just said, well, it, you know, I did what I did. It, it's over and gone. And they're moving on. And you're still stuck with it because you refuse to let it go. You become a hateful person and then you become difficult to live with. Who becomes so sensitive? You see, because the more you focus on your hurts and the more you focus on your offenses, the more hurts and offenses you'll see. What you focus on, and we talked about this in the Men's Forge last week, your perception, how you see things becomes what you begin to receive. So if you see offense everywhere, you're going to see more and more offenses. And so you become so sensitive now that every little thing sets you off. Is that how you want to live? It, that's why holding grudges, as I, as I started this, holding grudges, it's a lousy way to live. People who will not forgive are very difficult to remain close with. Here's why. Eventually their toxicity drives people away. Oh, but you know who it won't drive away? Toxic people. Birds of a feather flock together. If you're toxic, you're going to drive non-toxic people away and you're going to attract toxic people into your life. It's a lousy way to live. It's a lousy way to live. It causes trouble and defiles many and a bitter root grows up in you and you miss out on the grace of God. Oh, but you still got your hurts and your offenses. Oh, you're still holding on to what that person did to you and your good friends start to leave you and only bad friends want to be around you. Lousy way to live. Jesus is not toxic. Ever. And if we want to be like him, which I do, I want to be like Jesus. That's my life mission. My life decision was giving my heart to Jesus Christ, confessing him as my Lord and Savior. That was my life's biggest decision. From that decision has become my life mission to become like Christ in, in every way that I live, in every way that I think, in every way that I talk and act. And so Jesus is not toxic. And if I want to be like him, I, I can't be either. So we can't hold grudges. And in Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, they do not hold grudges. 
And God doesn't hold a grudge for his own good. Jesus doesn't hold grudges for his own good. Listen to what Isaiah writes about, about uh, our sins. This is what God says. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. Transgression, transgressions is a fancy word for sins. I, even I, am he who blots out your sins. For my own sake. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought it was for my sake. Oh, it is. Absolutely is. But it's for God's own sake that he blots out our transgressions and remembers your sins no more. He remembers them no more. How can God do that? I mean, God is omniscient. He knows everything. How could he blot out somebody's sin and remember them no more? Because he's God. Because he's so powerful that he can choose to completely forget something and never remember it again. I can't do that. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not great enough. My mind has to hold on to every little offense and hurt. Now, I can get past it and I can forget it in the sense that as I've forgiven it, the pain of it is gone. The upset of it is over and I'm reset. I'm not upset when I think about some offenses because I've forgiven. I'm reset into being a forgiver. And so God forgives and remembers our sins no more for his own sake. But could you imagine? Think about it for a second. Can you imagine what God would be like if he were to hold grudges? I, if God held grudges. Wow. I mean, how terribly frightening would he be? If God held grudges. Who, as, as David wrote in Psalms 130, who could stand? If God, did, if God didn't forgive, who, O oh Lord, could stand? Who could even stand before him? Who could even have any standing in life? We would be, a, we'd be gone. We'd be obliterated. If God held grudges, how frightening, how terribly frightening he would be. Also, okay, think about this. Since God knows everything, I just mentioned omniscient, all-knowing. Since God knows everything, there would be no end to all the sins he would have to deal with. I have a few offenses in life. God has a few million every minute because of all that he knows. And think about since the beginning of Adam to now, if God held grudges, all the sins he knows about, all that he would have to deal with. It's for his own sake he forgives us. It's for his own sake he remembers our sins no more. It's for our own sin that he blots them out of his memory. See, if God held grudges, so much bitterness and resentment would build up in him over the many, 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 many years of our many, 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 many sins. Can you imagine if God held grudges, the bitterness and resentment that would build in him? It's, but then God, the perfect one, would drive himself to madness and vengeance. He holds no grudges for his own sake because there is no bitter root in God. There is no bitter root in Jesus. He is on the cross, Jesus, being insulted. He's been beaten. He's being mocked. He's being spit on. And he says, Father, forgive them. There was no bitterness in Jesus through the whole ordeal. No bitterness in Jesus towards Judas Iscariot for betraying him. No bitterness in Jesus towards Peter for denying him. No bitterness in Jesus for all of his disciples fleeing at his time of need. No bitterness in Jesus. No resentment. For his own sake, God will not hold a grudge. For your own sake, don't hold grudges. It's a lousy way to live. God knows that. That's why he commands us. I'm going to say that again. That's why he commands us. 
to forgive so that you don't have a lousy life. For his own sake, God will not hold a grudge. He refuses to hold sins against us because he is joy, not bitterness. And you want to be joyful. You want to live a life of joy. Well, then you can't hold grudges because grudges, holding on, bearing a grudge will turn you into a bitter person and you will, all your joy will evaporate from your life. God is all sufficient. He doesn't need to get paid back. He doesn't need vengeance. He doesn't need, you don't owe him anything for his sin or for your sin. He paid for your sin. You don't owe him anymore. The wages of sin is death. What you owe God for your sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Romans 6, 23. See, what you owe God is death, but God says, I, you don't owe me anything because I'm all sufficient. I don't need anything from you. In fact, there's nothing you can give me. I just read in Isaiah not long ago, Isaiah 60, 66, that all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags to him. Now, Look, doing righteous things is good, and we're commanded to be righteous. We're commanded to do righteous. But don't think your righteousness is what earns you credits with God. Don't think your righteousness is what gets you into heaven. Jesus' righteousness is what gets you into heaven, is what gets all of us into heaven. And then God is peace. He's not chaos. Well, let me tell you something. If you have a bitter person in your home, Thanksgiving's going to have some chaos. Christmas could have some chaos. Whenever y'all get together, if you got a bitter uncle or you got a bitter aunt or you got a bitter wife or you got a bitter kid, it can cause some friction and chaos. There's no peace where there's where there's people holding grudges at a company. You get coworkers holding grudges against each other and it brings chaos to the workplace. God is peace, not chaos. He's love, not hate. Holding grudges leads people to hate. And then God is light, not, not, not darkness, no darkness in him. I'll tell you, holding a grudge makes you a dark person. There's a light that's gone from your eyes when you hold grudges. God is light, no darkness in him. Resentment towards us would negate who he is. So for his own sake, he doesn't hold grudges. God will never hold a grudge against you for your sin. Now, is he happy that you sinned? No. No, he's not happy that you sinned. For your own good. It's like, it's like my kids. When they used to do wrong, I wasn't happy they did wrong. But I wanted to deal with it and get it, get it dealt with so that we could move on. And walk in forgiveness towards my kids. And they would, they would you know, be upset that they sinned or, or they did wrong and disappointed me. And we would work it out. We'd talk it out. Sometimes we'd spank it out. And they would repent and all be good. And we'd dry the tears and hug and, and, and then, okay, now let's move on. That's our Father times infinity in love and grace and goodness would negate who he is. In Hebrews 10, 17, God says this, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Wow. That's a promise for us today. God won't hold a grudge. He'll remember your sins and lawless acts no more. What a blessing we have. So God, God won't hold a grudge for his own sake, but certainly for ours. <laughs> certainly for ours. I mean, if God held a grudge, we wouldn't be blessed. If God held a grudge, I don't know what we would have. I don't know where we'd be if God held grudges. Listen to what the prophet Micah writes. Who is a God like you? Who pardons sins and forgives. Who does not stay angry forever, but delights, but delights to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. Even though you've sinned. Maybe you're sitting in your chair, or you're sitting in your house or in your car. And you're thinking, man, I, 
I've, I've committed sins. God will again have compassion on you. He will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. The sea of forgetfulness. They're gone. He stamps them out. He wipes them out. And he wipes us clean. He will give, have compassion on you. See, God doesn't hold grudges because he can't. He can't. It's impossible for him. God is love. God is light. Things that we just talked about. He's the Prince of Peace. He is these things. And so if he held grudges, it didn't negate who he is. So he can't. But here's the other thing. More than that, he doesn't want to. That's not his nature. That's not what he wants to do. Some people want to hold grudges. Some people want to be offended. Some people are looking for offenses. Not God. God tells us in Proverbs 19 to overlook offenses. It's to our glory. Sure, you could be offended by so many things if you wanted to be, if you were looking for it. I don't want to be offended. I want to overlook them. Ah, move on. I don't, it's not worth it. Getting offended is not worth my peace. Not worth my joy. God doesn't want to hold, offend, uh, hold grudges. He loves us so much. He delights in showing his mercy. He delights in it. That's what, that's what, you know, really fuels God is to be merciful. That's what makes him happy is to be merciful. It doesn't make God happy to punish. That's not what gives him joy. It gives him joy to show mercy. It gives him joy to show us love. Just like so many parents, you delight in showing mercy to your kids when they mess up. How much more so, God? Unlike what some think, and there are people that think this way, even church people, they think that God is angry by nature. That he's punitive by nature. That God likes to punish. That God's in heaven just waiting for you to mess up so he can, he can rebuke you. That's not him. That's the wrong. You're, if that's the God you're serving, you're serving the wrong God. That's not the God of scripture. It's not the God of the Bible. I know. I read the Bible. I know what God says about himself. He is a forgiver. He is, he is love. He is mercy. He delights in showing mercy. He's not an angry God. God is a happy God. Our God is not some stern-faced old man with long, you know, white hair and a gray beard or white beard just waiting to pounce, waiting to punish. God is happy. Our God is a delightful God. He's a joyous God. I think that's what ticked the Pharisees off so much about Jesus when he walked on earth is how much joy Jesus had, how much life he had, how much, how much happiness he had. Jesus was happy. That's why people wanted to be around him. That's why, that's why multitudes flocked to be with Jesus. Not because he was stern and mean and telling them what they did wrong. It's because Jesus was fun to be with. People like to be around Jesus. You don't like being around angry people, crotchety old people, grudge bearers, easily offended people. It's lousy, lousy way to live. Our God's happy. He's not an angry God. Out of his compassion, God wants to remove our sins so we can be friends and family. I'm on the friends and family plan with God. And the friends and family plan with God is he removes my sins. And I thank him. I ask him to forgive me. And I, and I thank him for his forgiveness. And then, and then I, I praise Jesus for the blood he shed for me. And I'm on the friends and family plan with God. How about you? Well, see, listen, to be in his family, one of the, one of the traits of God's family, every family has traits. The Wilsons had traits. Our family had traits. We had a culture within our family. There were things that in our family you did not do. There were things in our family that if you did, you got in trouble. Well, I'll tell you, God's family is full of forgivers. Nobody in God's family is allowed to hold grudges. Nobody. God doesn't allow it. He says, you will forgive. If you want me to forgive you, 
then you will forgive. Jesus said that in Mark chapter 11. When you stand praying, forgive, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. 11.25. Mark 11.25. Don't miss the grace of God. So be on the friends and family plan. That means you're a forgiver because God's a forgiver. God doesn't hold grudges. Because God holds no grudges, think about this, your sins. He holds no grudges. So why not talk to him about it? He can be trusted with any and everything. God, I'm really hurt by this person. I'm really angry at what they did. But, Lord, I know that you've forgiven me, and I know you want me to forgive him. So let's get this forgiveness thing going. And, and Lord, help me to forgive where I can't forgive. Let me lean on your forgiveness for them until I can start to forgive them out of a desire to forgive them. Because right now I don't want to forgive them. You can trust God with everything. Your fears, your hurts, your offenses, your sins, your own sins, the sins of others. He can be trusted. As, as the east is far from the west. Well, how far is that? Have you ever stopped to think, how far is the east is from the west? How, how far is that? I don't know. That's what, you know, God asked Job some questions. Hey, you know what Job's answer was? Oh, only you know. <laughs> because we don't know. God knows how far the east is from the west, but we don't. So far as he removed our transgressions from us. It's for our own sake, too. He doesn't bear grudges for his own sake, and he doesn't bear grudges certainly for ours. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Let's bow your heads. Hey, listen, I know you've been hurt. Who hasn't? We've all been hurt. Some of you have been hurt terribly bad. Some of you have been hurt by people that you really trusted. And they, they not only let you down, but they injured you. I get it. I've been injured. I've had people hurt me. I've been hurt physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually let down by pastors and leaders. We all have. And I've let people down. And I've hurt people. I don't want to hold grudges. I don't, want to, I don't want to hold any grudges against anyone. It doesn't do me any good. It's a lousy way to live. Will you acknowledge that? Will you acknowledge that you're holding a grudge right now is a lousy way to live? That the joy in your life is evaporating? The peace in your life is dissipating? You want to be strong in joy and strong in peace strong in love. You want to be on a friends and family plan with God. So you got to be a forgiver. It's part of his family. They don't hold grudges. Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Jesus, that you died on the cross for us. You shed your blood. You shed your blood so that I could be free. So I could be free of sin. Washed. Purified. I could wear robes of, of, that are white. Not tainted by my by my sins. And God, thank you that you remember them no more so that when I can come to you, we start fresh every day, every morning. Your, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your love and compassion for me. Father, thank you for everyone that's been listening and I pray that you bless each one of them in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and thanks for, for being a part of today's message. Have a great day.